Hey, third graders, we are gonna, I'm gonna start reading more of the Sisters Graham. We have two more chapters in this book, um, chapters 10 and 11, and they're, 10 kind of long, so I'm gonna read to you chapter 10 today. Um, so we have left off and Sabrina and Daphne, Daphne had magically turned into Mama Bear and the Tin Man, and they had snuck into Charming's house. They went into the very port landing ball with the Ever Afters because they suspect that Charming has something to do with the giant, and they had just snuck into his office at the end of chapter nine. I, I didn't want to miss, miss such a lovely party, Sabrina stammered. Next to the door sat a quill of arrows. Charming selected one, inserted it in the crossbow, and pulled the bowstring back. Then he aimed it at Sabrina's heart. I'm going to give you until the count of five to tell me who you are, or your head is going to join the others on my wall, he threatened coolly. I'm not playing any more games with you people, Charming said. I've already told you I'm not interested in joining the Scarlet Hand. Your revolution is not for me. We don't know what you're talking about, Daphne cried. One, Charming began counting. Sabrina looked over at the clock. There were only seconds left before the magic would wear off, but more than the five, Charming had promised them. We're Ralda Grimm's granddaughters, she blurted out desperately. Two. We used the magic wand to, to change our shape so we could sneak into your house, Daphne cried. Oily tears leaked from her eyes. Three, we're not part of any revolution, Sabrina begged. We just want our grandmother back. Four, we're not lying to you, Daphne sobbed. Five, Sabrina closed her eyes tightly and awaited her death, wondering if she would be stuffed like the other bear in Charming's office or if her body would change back after her heart had stopped beating. But when nothing happened after a few more moments, Sabrina bravely opened her eyes. She and her sister had magically transformed back into their normal states. The only evidence of their disguises was the oily smears on Daphne's cheek. Ladies, I could toss you into jail and throw away the key for what you've done, Charming said, removing the arrow from his crossbow. You've used a magical item to help a known criminal escape from jail, infiltrated an Ever After's party without an invitation, impersonated ever afters, committed espionage, that's spying, against a government official, broken into my home, put the fairy port landing ball in serious jeopardy, and ruined two pairs of Sheriff Hampstead's pants. We didn't ruin your stupid party, Sabrina argued. If that crowd downstairs sees the two of you here, the top of this house will blow off, Charming replied. The only way we're going to prevent a mob is to have Hampstead toss you in some old sacks and carry you out the servants on he can take you down to the jailhouse and let you cool off in a cell. Sabrina lunged for the video camera. The wires came with it, and the image of a giant faded from the television screen. We're not going anywhere without our grandmother and Mr. Connus, Sabrina said. This tape is all the evidence we'll need. How do you think those people downstairs are going to feel knowing you intended to buy up this town and smash anyone that gets in your way? Sabrina expected Charming to fight for the tape, but instead he only laughed. <laughs> Oh, you're just like your parents, Charming chuckled. Henry was always shooting off his mouth before his brain could catch up, and Veronica was the suspicious one. What an unsettling combination you are. Suddenly, something moved in the window. Sabrina turned her head, but nothing was there. Did you see that? See what? Charming asked, as a giant, pus-filled eye peered into the house. Englishman? A booming voice growled, shaking the windows in their frames. There, yeah, the girls shouted. Charming calmly picked up the phone on his desk and dialed the number. Uh, Mr. Seven, are you aware that there's a giant outside? He said into the receiver, as if he were just informing a waiter that there was a hair in his suit. Oh, you didn't know? Well, uh, now you do. No, this isn't some kind of emergency drill. I agree we should do something about it before the guests panic. Maybe you should send the witches out to put a protection spell on the house. Yes, of course it's a good idea. Charming slammed the phone down across the room and dragged both girls roughly out of the office and down the hall. Where are you taking us, Sabrina demanded. Keep your heads down and don't say a word, the prince sneered. I'm taking you outside. An acidy fear rose up in Sabrina's throat as they stumbled out of his office and into the second floor hallway. You can't take us out there with that thing, Sabrina cried, pulling at Charming's eyes like grasp. You wanted to find your grandmother? Well, her ride just showed up, he said. Help! Sabrina cried as they turned a corner and headed down the hall toward the back of the house. 
Daphne took her sister's cue and called for help as well, causing many of the guests to look up and see what was happening. Those are the Grimm children, an orangutan shouted angrily. No need to let it ruin your evening, said Charming with his toothy smile. I have the situation under control. They're spying on us, the Queen of Hearts gasped. Off with their... They aren't spies, my friends, the prince said as he changed course, pulling the girls down the stairs with him into the angry crowd. Please go back to your celebration. But before he could get the words out of his mouth, a horrible crunching sound filled the room. The party goers looked to the ceiling, only to see it ripped away right before their eyes. Pieces of plaster fell down around everyone and a collective scream erupted among the ever afters. The sky is falling, the sky is falling. A chicken cried as it raced for the door, only to get caught in a stampede of terror when the hole in the roof was replaced by a giant's horrible, gnarled face, breathing its rancid, rotten egg breath down on the crowd. The Queen of Hearts ran to a nearby window, threw open the curtains, and tried to climb out. Her playing card attendants rushed over in time to catch her from falling over. The rest of the crowd ran in all directions, and the panic gave Sabrina and Daphne a chance to break Charming's grip. They rushed into the crowd and ducked between legs and feathers as all sorts of unusual creatures rushed around them. Where's the murderer? The giant bellowed. He's not here, big boy. The murderer is not here, Charming said as he turned to face the monster. Why are you protect him? The giant growled. I smell his blood. He released me in hopes of killing me, but my fate will not be like my brothers and sisters. He's here and I will have him. Charming looked up the staircase at the violinists who were scattering in fear. I didn't tell you to stop playing, he said, snapping his fingers at them. Bewildered, the musicians went back to their overturned chairs, set them upright, and began playing music as if a giant wasn't staring down at them. Fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of him. I think we've had enough of your temper tantrum, Charming interrupted. Suddenly, three figures fluttered into the air and hovered around the giant's head. One of them was an ugly old woman darting through the air on a broom. The second was a strikingly exotic beauty dressed in all black who levitated off the ground. And the third was a blonde lady inside a silver bubble. As she floated by, Sabrina recognized her as Glinda from the hospital. All three had magic wands that they waved threateningly at the giant. The monster swatted at the witches, but they weaved and bobbed out of the way of his massive hand. The ugly witch waved her wand and a rocket of flame shot out of it and exploded on the giant's chest, searing his shirt and causing him to scream in agony. Stop, Daphne cried. Our family's in his pocket. The little girl broke away from her sister and ran outside. Serena followed by Charming, and he rushed after. The witches had flown out of the hole in the roof and now continued their assault. Leave while you can, giant, Charming shouted. The second witch raised her wand and a stream of lightning fired out it, hitting the giant in his face. The giant roared with pain and raised his hands to block the bolt. A charred black smear was added to the other ugly features on his grizzled face. Glinda waved her wand and a spray of ice froze the giant's backside and continued to cover the rest of his body. Within seconds, a massive, the massive man was encased in an ice tomb. But soon cracks appeared and with flexing muscles and a powerful roar, the giant broke free. Enormous chunks of ice rained down on the parking lot, flattening an unlucky car. The doors of the mansion were thrown wide and a dozen men rushed out past the girls. Each was in a purple tunic embroidered with a red lion on the chest. Swinging their swords wildly in the air, they roared a war cry as they rushed toward the giant. At the front of the attack was a man Sabrina knew to be King Arthur. The knights charged the giant's feet and together they whacked angrily at his big toe. The giant roared at the assault and stomped his feet angrily, trying to squash his attackers. Each of the men was lightning quick and dodged the giant's blows, managing to strike at his exposed ankle in the process. Shrieking in pain, the giant quickly turned and fled. Charming knelt in respect as the king and his knights turned to face him. Ah, oh, I am indebted to the knights of the round table. Thank you, your highness, Tron said. Your thanks is not enough, Charming, King Arthur barked. That beast destroyed my car. I trust you'll pay for the damage. Charming scowled, but as the party guests filed out of the half-destroyed mansion, he forced a smile. Mr. Seven rushed to the prince's side, carrying a large black pot he held out to the approaching crowd. 
friends. Who says nothing exciting ever happens in Fort, Fort Landing, the prince chuckled. But this time his wit and his charm fell on angry ears. The people passed him, returning his laughter with disgusted looks. Is this what we're paying you for? The white rabbit said as he hopped past. People, there's no need to leave. We'll have the mansion back to its old self in just a matter of moments. There's plenty of food and drink. Oh, we've even arranged a door prize. As an elected leader of this community, I would have thought you'd take the safety of your constituents much more seriously, a Bengal tiger said as she walked past. I assure you, Sher Khan. But the tiger didn't stop to hear Charming's assurances. Well, if you must all go, please don't forget to donate to the Fairyport Community Fund, the prince continued, picking Mr. Seven, who immediately held the pot higher so that everyone could see. But not a single penny was added to the donations. I do believe this town is in need of some new leadership, the Queen of Hearts said as she left. Charming said nothing as he watched the last of his guests drive away. Put the pot down, Mr. Seven, he said. The dwarf slowly lowered the pot and took a peek inside. We want our grandmother and her friend, Sabrina demanded. This is all your fault, Charming said as he turned to them. What? You two brought him here. Hey, if you can't control your giant, then maybe you shouldn't be working with one, Daphne advised. Not working with any giant. Only a fool who wants to be someone's lunch would deal with a giant, Charming said. That's a lie, Sabrina said. He's one of your goons, just like those guys you met at the cabin. Ladies, I'm nobility. I don't have goons. Those men don't work for me. I was there to arrest them and their boss. Well, if you're not their boss, then who is, Sabrina said. Charming snatched the video from Sabrina's hand. He opened a side panel where a small LCD screen folded out. Then he rewound the recording, pressed the play button, and handed the camera back to the girls. The image was shaky at first, but then suddenly it cleared up as the person holding the camera set it down on the hill that overlooked Appleby's farm. Four men were talking to one another. Two of them were extremely tall, another was short and fat, and the fourth couldn't be seen. It was obvious who the other three were, Bobby, Tony, and Steve the goons who had attacked the family at the hospital. Finally, the fourth figure stepped in front of the lens, leaned down and grinned broadly. It was Jack. That's evidence we found on Jack when he was arrested. He wanted to tape himself killing a giant, Charming cried. It had nothing to do with the farmhouse. In fact, he thought the farmer had left town. Jack laughed wildly at the camera, held up a small white bean and then rushed down the hill. Soon the familiar footage of the beanstalk and the destruction of the giant played again. So you're not trying to buy up the town and rebuild your kingdom, Daphne asked. Actually, I am trying to buy up this town, Charming said. But there are better ways to get what you want than to let a giant loose on the countryside. Sabrina didn't know whether to be furious with his admission or respect his honesty. So why did you send the sheriff after us, Daphne asked. Uh, he was supposed to pick you up and take you somewhere safe until we could hunt down the giant and find your grandmother, Charming said. Every ever after in this town wishes we were dead, Sabrina said. Why would you help us? I have my reasons. I'm confused, Daphne said. Why would Jack bring us here and tell us this story about you being a bad guy? And why didn't he want to stay in contact with these if he was just going to take off, Sabrina said, handing Charming her walkie-talkie. Because, Charming said, if he kept you busy, he could go back to your house. But he can't get in. He doesn't have the keys, Sabrina replied. <gasps> he doesn't need the keys, Daphne gasped. We didn't say to goodbye to the house we left. <gasps> we used the ruby slippers. Sabrina, the house is unlocked. Pam said in his human form came rushing out of the mansion. I've got the deputies chasing the giant, he said. He's heading into the woods in the direction of Widow's Peak. Good job, Charming said. The sheriff beamed with pride. We've also searched the grounds. There's no sign of Jack, but we did find this. He held out Jack's bloody handkerchief. So the giant would smell him and come running, Charming said. You might as well join your men, Sheriff. The girls and I will call you if we need you. Where are you going, Hampstead asked. The prince took Sabrina's arm and urged Daphne to do the same. We're going back to the Grim House. I have an unsettling notion of what our giant killer is up to, Charming said. 
Sabrina clicked her heels together. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. Instantly, the girls and Charming were standing outside of Granny's house. The front door was wide open, and through the doorway, they could see that Jack had ransacked their home. They walked inside. Bookshelves were tipped over. Furniture was overturned. And even the couch cushions were thrown aside. He had searched through every kitchen cupboard, emptied closets, and destroyed antiques. But his crimes against the house weren't what was bothering Sabrina. What hurt her was that she had been tricked. In the last year and a half, Sabrina had learned to be street smart and savvy. She was the one who was supposed to pull fast ones on people. She was the queen of the sneaks. And now she had been tricked. Suddenly the telephone rang. She picked up the receiver and said, hello. Hello, this is Wilma Thay at Action 4 News. I'm following up on a tip we got about half an hour ago. A Mr. Englishman said that there would be a murder on Widow's Peak tonight. We've already got a camera crew on their way, but we were hoping we might be able to speak to Mr. Englishman first, the woman said. No, he's not here, Sabrina replied. Well, if you see him, please tell him that we're very intrigued by the story and we will have a camera team and a reporter there as he requested, the woman continued. Then with a click, she hung up. That was a reporter, Sabrina said. Jack called them and told them there was going to be a murder on Widow's Peak tonight. This is exactly what I was trying to prevent. He's going to kill a giant on television so he can be famous again, Charming said. When the world sees that, this little town will be turned upside down by reporters. There's too much here to explain. We've got to stop him. Elvis, Daphne cried suddenly. The giant dog was nowhere to be seen. Daphne shouted his name and for several painful moments of silence. Then a low bark was heard from upstairs. Daphne rushed up the steps, followed by Sabrina and Charming. She threw open the door to Mirror's room and found Elvis lying on the floor in a small puddle of his own blood. He had a serious cut on his belly, but he barked happily when he saw the girls. Daphne knelt down and kissed the dog gently on the nose. When she lifted her face, tears were pouring down her cheeks. He hurt Elvis, the little girl sobbed. Girls, we have to find Jack, Charming said coldly. We don't have time for this mongrel. Sabrina and Daphne looked at the man as if he were a moldy sandwich that had slowly turned to soup in the bottom of the refrigerator. The prince groaned, took his cell phone from his pocket. He dialed a number and sighed impatiently. Oh, Mr. Seven, I need you to send one of the three to the Grim House. The door is open so she can come right in. There's a dog that needs medical assurance. Yes, a dog. No, D-O-G. No, Mr. Seven, I don't know what's wrong with him. Maybe a broken rib. No, Mr. Seven. Yes, Mr. Seven. Mr. Seven, if you don't stop asking questions, I'm going to feed you to this dog. Sabrina eyed the man suspiciously and Charming caught her gaze. Oh, and Mr. Seven, my orders are that whichever witch comes, she respect this house, no snooping. And Charming hung up. Daphne wrapped her arms around the prince's neck and hugged him as he hung up his phone. Thank you, she sobbed, and for a brief moment, Charming seemed to enjoy the hug, but then he pulled away from her. You're ruining my suit, he said wiping his lapel clean of the girl's tears. We should check the mirror. Sabrina gazed over at it. The little man who was usually in its reflection was missing. Mirror, Charming shouted. You have to step through it, Sabrina said. I'm aware of how it works, the prince said. I used to be engaged to one of its former owners. He was engaged to Snow White. The little man known as Mirror was lying on his side on the cold marble floor, barely conscious and covered in bruises. Charming knelt down to him and lifted the pudgy man's head. Mira slowly opened his eyes and grimaced in pain. He was too strong and fast for me. I, I couldn't stop him, Mira groaned. What did he take, Charming asked. I tried to bite him off, but he just laughed at me. You won't believe how quick he is, Mira complained. Focus, man, we need to know, did Jack take anything? He took the beans, Mira said. How? didn't have a key, Sabrina said, reaching into her pocket and pulling out Granny's key ring. I forgot to remind you to lock the door after you let him take a peek at the jar, said the little man. I don't get it, Sabrina said. If killing the giant will make him famous again, why does he want all the beans? It's insurance. If his fame starts to fade, he'll let another giant out with another one of those beans. The giant will kill people and destroy things, and then Jack will come to the rescue, Charmy explained. But how's he going to find the giant in the first place, Sabrina asked. We haven't been able to find him and he's 200 feet tall. He's not gonna have to find it. It's going to find him, Charming said. 
Giants have a great sense of smell, especially when it comes to blood. That's why the giant showed up at the mansion. Jack left his bloody handkerchief and the giant could smell it. It's amazing really that they can smell anything over their own stink. If one touches you, you can't wash off the odor for weeks. Suddenly, Sabrina thought of the two pieces of fabric Elvis had brought into the room just before the group had left for Charming's mansion. One was Granny Rilda's cloth from the giant, and the other was a piece of Jack's pants. <sighs> Elvis was trying to warn us that Jack had been near a giant, Sabrina realized. She was a terrible detective. She couldn't recognize a clue when it was offered to her by a 200-pound Great Dane. She wanted to kick herself, but she had to focus on what Charming had said. But if giants have such great noses, why didn't this one attack us here? Jack was in our house for hours, she said. Protection spells. If Rel does anything, she's careful. We have one on the jailhouse too. So what are we going to do? Mirror, I'm gonna need something, Charming said. Sabrina unlocked the door labeled Magical Armory and let the prince inside. The room was filled with all types of weapons and bows and arrows and a nasty looking pole with a spiky metal ball attached by a chain and hundreds of other things. Some were obviously magical as they glowed or hum, while most were just shining with horrible possibilities. Charming pointed to a sword on the wall. That's the one, he said. Mirror hobbled into the room with a worried face. I find this very unwise. There's already one ever after running around with magic. This town does not need a second, especially with Excalibur. Any person whose skin is pierced by its blade is a goner. Even the tiniest scratch will kill you. Sabrina took the sword off the wall and held it in her hand. It was long and wide with a jewel encrusted handle. An odd tingle raced through her when she held it in both hands. She felt powerful, the way King Arthur must have felt when Excalibur belonged to him. Sabrina, is this someone you can trust? Mira asked. No, he's not, said Sabrina. I've heard what this town thinks of my family and what my death might mean for your freedom. How do I know you won't just stab me in the back when I'm not looking? Grim, you're not my friend, Charming said. I hate your family for the life that they've forced me to live for the last 200 years, and I resent you for the future that you represent. And if I were doing this for your worthless family, you would probably be right. But I'm not doing this for you, I'm doing this for me. As much as Baba Yaga's spell has trapped me in Fairyport Landing, it's also been good for me. I have power here, I have wealth and respect, if Jack shows the world that giants and fairy tales are real, then life in this town will change. And my position as its ruler, I, I, I mean mayor, might be challenged. Therefore, you and I are in an unusual situation. Tonight, I'm your ally, and I will help you save your grandmother and Connus. If that is the only solution, then so be it. But rest assured, Grim, tomorrow I am your enemy again. Sabrina looked up into his eyes and saw that he was being honest even if his brand of honesty made her sick to her stomach. Could she trust him? She reached into her pocket, took out the picture of her family, and gazed at their faces, her mother and father, Mr. Connors, and finally Granny Relda. She had to do something to get the old woman back. She wasn't going to lose her family all over again. She took the heavy sword and handed it to him. Mira continued to protest, limping along, as Charming and Sabrina exited the, exited the room and returned through the mirror. Daphne was waiting for them with Elvis. They gently carried the dog into the hallway and then Sabrina carefully locked the door to Mirror's room. You stay with Elvis, Sabrina ordered her sister. No way, we're Grimm's, this is what we do. But this is dangerous. Whatever, the little girl said, grabbing Sabrina's hand tightly. Sabrina surrendered, hooked her finger into Charming's pocket and clicked Dorothy's shoes together. There's no place like where Jack is, she said. Sabrina. <gasps> Couldn't these shoes take us to wherever mom and dad are? Daphne wondered. Sabrina's eyes grew wide with possibility. We can save them next, her sister said happily. Okay, Sabrina said, clicking her heels together. There's no place like where Jack is. There's no place like where Jack is. There's no place like where Jack is. The lights went out and the familiar squeaky wheeze filled Sabrina's ears. In a split second, Charming and the girls were standing in the woods of Widow's Peak. They had a little time to adjust to their new surroundings. Sabrina looked above her and saw a giant's massive foot preparing to crush them. They managed to leap out of the way, but the aftershock tossed them around as if they were on a sinking ship. The ground split apart, sending stones and soil into a gaping crevice where the group had once stood. The giant leaned down to get a better look at the three people scurrying at his feet. 
He reached to snatch them, but a flaming arrow zipped up from the tree line and landed in the side of the giant's face. The monster cried in pain as he plucked it from his cheek, only to have a second and a third arrow pierce his chin. Stop it, Jack, Sabrina demanded. There are people in the giant's pocket, and if you kill him, they'll die when he falls. Jack peered his head out from behind some branches in a nearby tree and laughed. Oh, it's not time to kill him yet, he shouted, remaining safely hidden in the trees. I'm just trying to get him good and angry. We know about the reporters, Jack, Charming said. We're never going to let that happen. Jack fired several more arrows into the giant's face, landing a painful shot to the monster's lower lip. The giant raged as he tried to pluck it out. While the giant was busy, the young man dropped out of the tree and landed as nimbly as a cat. Blimey, Charming and the Grin's on the same side. I never thought I'd live to see the day, he said. Has the prince turned traitor like that worthless Monro Conus? The only allegiance I have is to myself, Charming said as he waved Excalibur in the air. Now we can do this the easy way or the hard way, but the result will be the same. You're going back to jail. Sorry, prince, but I've spent my last day in the fairy court landing lockup. My fans await, Jack said, loading another arrow into his bow and firing it at the giant. It pierced the skin between two fingers on the giant's left hand and he shrieked. Overcome with rage, the giant swept his arm across the tops of the forest trees, cracking many ancient cedars in half. A sizable chunk of one fell from the sky and nearly hit Charming in the head. Oh, he's angry now, the giant killer laughed, loading his arrow again. This time he aimed it at Charming. Jack, don't, Sabrina cried. I was hoping it wouldn't have to come to this, he said as he lined up the arrow with Charming's heart. But don't worry, I promise to have them spell your name correctly in your obituary. He released his arrow and the girls watched it soar through the air at Charming. Daphne screamed and squeezed her sister's hand, knowing Jack's aim was true. But something happened the girls didn't expect. Charming lifted Excalibur slightly and the arrow bounced off its metal blade and fell to the ground. Jack was flabbergasted. What luck you have. Try again, see if it was luck, the prince said, stepping forward with the sword. With hands like lightning, Jack fired another arrow and Charming deflected it with similar results. Jack pulled three arrows from his quill and lined them up together on his bow. He fired them all at the same time. Sabrina watched in, is in amazement as Charming guided Excalibur to block each of their deadly course. I can do this all night, the prince bragged, but just then the giant's monstrous, monstrous hand swung down and hit him from behind. Excalibur was knocked free of his grip and fell at Sabrina's feet. Charming was sent sailing through the forest, landing painfully against a tree and slumping to the ground. Jack pulled more arrows from his quill, lit them with a lighter. Sabrina realized from Granny's kitchen and fired five off with furious speed. Each landed in more of the giant's sensitive spots. The painful barrage was enough to get the giant to back off giving the young man an opportunity to turn to the girls. He put another arrow into his bow and aimed it at Sabrina. Instinctively, Sabrina reached down and snatched Excalibur from the ground. It was incredibly heavy and bulky, but she swung it around in the air as best she could. What do you think you're gonna do with that, duck? Jack scoffed. Grims aren't killers. You don't have it in you. Well, we're kind of new at this job. If we break a couple of rules, that just goes with the learning process. Sabrina said with as much bravery as she could muster. Her courage was short-lived as Jack got closer. She noticed something painted on his shirt. It was a red hand, just like the one the police had found in her parents' abandoned car. It sent a chill through her body. You took my parents, Sabrina said. Jack looked down at the red hand and smiled. No, I didn't, but I know who did. The scarlet hand has plans for them. Where are they, Daphne cried. He laughed. You know, I grew up reading about you, Sabrina said, trying to keep Jack busy. You had a very exciting story. You climbed the beanstalk, you killed the giant, and captured the treasure. Lots of kids think of you as a hero. But not you. Once, but now, now that I've met you, the real Jack, I see what a rotten person you are. That's what you're famous for now, Jack not being a giant killer, but being a scum. Give me the sword, girl, so I can cut your tongue out, he threatened. Daphne, I want you to run away and get some help, Sabrina said. 
She couldn't deflect Jack's arrow and she didn't want her sister to see her die. I won't do it, Daphne said. Jack pulled his bowstring back further and just as he was about to fire his arrow, the giant's foot came down on top of him, giving the man only a split second to leap out of the way. Daphne grabbed her sister's hand and together they raced into the forest, dodging trees and branches. Jack followed closely behind and worse, the giant strode after him. Its first step landed several yards behind them. An arrow whizzed by and impaled itself into a nearby tree. That was a warning shot, ladies, the young man shouted as he loaded another arrow. I'm quite good with this thing. Suddenly, the two girls were slipping down the side of a hill into an ice cold creek. Another arrow splashed in the water at Sabrina's feet as they pulled themselves out of the stream and continued to run. With now frozen feet, they did their best to avoid the jagged rocks and the litter that littered the forest floor, but soon Sabrina took a tumble and fell end over end across the ground. She tried to stand up and quickly realized she was missing something, her left shoe. Dorothy's left slipper lay glistening in the moonlight behind her. It had fallen off. Come on, Daphne begged as she tried to help her big sister to her feet, but Sabrina crawled desperately toward the shoe. It was their only chance of finding their parents. She used her arm to pull herself along the ground, knowing that Jack would fall upon her at any second. But before she could reach it, the giant's foot came down hard on the top of the slipper. The vibration shook and the girls shook the girls and sent them tumbling. When the giant lifted his foot, the shoe was gone. The only thing remaining was a piece of glistening fabric that turned to dust in Sabrina's hands. Heartbroken, Sabrina pulled her sister behind a huge oak tree and the two of them rested. Don't worry, I'll think of something, she said, squeezing her sister's hand. But the sound of a monstrous crash drowned Sabrina's answer and flooded the forest. Splintering wood and damp soil rained from the sky as the tree they stood next to was violently uprooted. The girls looked up into the face of death towering above them and felt its hot, pungent breath blow their hair back from their scalps. What's happened to our lives? Sabrina wondered. The giant tossed the tree aside and then reached down with his rubby hand to pick them up. But just as he did, Sabrina thrust Excalibur into the air. The giant's hand plunged into its blade and suddenly his eyes lit up into surprise. What was that? He asked softly. He stood up as if he was in a daze, unsure of where he was. The anger in his face melted away, replaced by a sort of calm curiosity, and he began to wobble on his feet. Unable to keep his balance, he sailed backward, landing flat on his back and crushing an acre of forest beneath him. A thick cloud of dust rose above, rose above his body and settled down all around them. Half a pound of soil landed in Sabrina's blonde hair. And then all was still. I, I didn't mean for that to happen, Sabrina said, looking at in horror at the sword still clutched in her hand. Granny Velda and Mr. Clemens. Daphne whispered as tears filled her eyes. Jack rushed through the brush and saw the giant lying dead on the ground. You killed him? I was gonna kill him, he said. It's over, Jack, said Sabrina. It's not over until I say it's over, Jack raged. I'm gonna be famous again, but for another reason. Tonight the ever afters of Fairy Court Landing are going to find they are suddenly free from the spell has them, that has kept them in this mercilessly boring town for two centuries. With your grandma now dead, the spell turns to the last group living grim. Some might be patient enough to wait for you two to die of old age, but I am not. This ends tonight. End of chapter 10.